Oh my goodness, the internet of things and advertising. Um, well, it's going to be really important for, I suppose, for a, for a couple of reasons. Um, I mean, the first one is just the amount of insight that we're going to get as advertisers and that publishers um, will have as well from all those devices that, that have sensors embedded in them. Um, it, you know, we get so much more information which can enable us to be much more personal and much more relevant in our advertising. Um, in fact, it puts me in mind of, of an example I was talking about with somebody earlier today. Um, that this, this issue that when you go searching online for stuff um, and you find what you want, maybe you buy it. And then four months later, you're still being followed around by that tent um, that you already bought and therefore you don't want it anymore. But, you know, so not relevant. Personal, yes, because I'm, I'm interested in buying a tent. Um, not relevant because I've already bought it, thank you very much, and don't plan to ever buy another. Um, and so I think that, you know, the Internet of Things is actually going to enable this extreme personalization and extreme context and relevance. And that's going to make a huge difference to, it, to everything for us. But of course, the other thing is that it's, going to, um, it's also going to enable us to advertise on a different scale. Um, it's going to completely change um, the way that we deliver um, personal advertising to a device, you know, to, to your phone or whatever. Um, so you think about some of the beacon technology that we're starting to see. So you integrate that with, with other Internet of Things um, uh, insights and uh, data that's being gathered. Um, you're going to be able to target an individual as they walk down the street in a way that probably never seemed possible in the past. So Watson uh, and personalization uh, and what does that, you know, what, what's the future around that? Well, well, it's interesting because Watson is basically cognitive computing. Um, what does that mean? It means that it can take the most enormous amounts of data, you know, terabyte after terabyte after terabyte and process it incredibly fast. Um, uh, and what that enables us to do. So personalization in healthcare, for example, is about a, a, a remedy for just you. Not for the person who's got the same illness as you down the street, but just you, based on your DNA, um, uh, the very specific case history, other things about you. Um, and so, you know, starting to see that kind of thing. So, okay, that's a healthcare example. Start to imagine how you might apply that to the world of marketing. Things get really interesting. So the ability to very rapidly, and I'm, you know, like very, very fast, be able to work through an enormous amount of data. I mean, when people talk about big data, you know, Watson copes with the very biggest of data at an unbelievable speed um, and will then be able to make recommendations um, to you. So um, I think the application of that from a marketing perspective, um, you know, we haven't, uh, we haven't really scratched the surface of it yet, but, uh, but I think that you're going to be able to get to um, very complex, uh, very detailed, personal, relevant recommendations for one individual human being um, and, uh, and being able to apply that to um, you know, parts of um, the commercial world will be an extraordinary opportunity. Communicating Watson is actually an interesting challenge for a marketer because it's, it feels a little bit like the crown jewels. It's this really exciting thing. You know, here is a computer, essentially, that, that managed to beat human beings at, that, at a very complex uh, game show in the States, Jeopardy. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, so it has all this uh, kudos and all this uh, interest in, uh, amongst people. And it's a great, a great advocate, really, to get people to think about computing and technology in a completely different way. Um, but in terms of how we market it, we have to be a little bit careful, really, because everybody's really interested in it. Um, and we could, um, you know, we could profile Watson at every event we ever go to and, and on pretty much every web page we ever serve. And people are interested. But we have to, I think, also keep focus on how do you use this capability to be really game-changing? How do you use this capability to be transformational? Which is interesting that we started out in healthcare, but you're seeing it crop up in finance, for example, in banking. Um, and actually, it has the potential to be applied to every industry, every kind of commercial organization, every kind of um, uh, public sector organization. So um, you'll see us introduce new um, Watson capabilities, new Watson solutions, um, across the board as we go forward, but the, the, it's a curious thing. It's not something we have to hype because actually it's doing that all by itself, the sheer excitement of seeing it proven because people have talked about you know, cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, natural, natural language processing for a long time. Watson's the first true evocation of making that you know, real. So I would say the ultimate aim of Watson is actually to exemplify 
the, the art of the possible with technology and computing. Because what, it, what Watson does is it takes the best of what human beings can do, um, it takes a massive processing power, and it enables us to bring those two things together. And then what it does is it advises us. So people often think of Watson as you know, some kind of futuristic science fiction, replacing the human being, don't need humans anymore. That isn't what Watson does. Watson advises, Watson recommends, always need a human being with subject matter expertise to take the final step. Um, and so ultimately, you know, a fabulous advisor who can advise on deeply complex uh, data sets, who can take enormous amounts of information and, and narrow it, the answer down to you know, a recommendation, um, uh, and, uh, but, but then to have a human being who makes the ultimate decision. Uh, on, on what they do with that recommendation. Um, and I think, that, I think that's an extraordinary thing to be able to do. You know, you, we often talk about it in healthcare terms because it's something that we can all relate to as, as individual people. You know, we all know what that feels like. Um, you know, the ability to bring all of human knowledge together and process it and then yield from that something useful. In the past, we relied on the, 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 the serendipity of two brilliant people talking together you know, figuring out a problem together. Now we have Watson to deliver serendipity for us, uh, really. Um, and, uh, and, and, it's, and it's real, um, uh, the only things that are really going to slow it down is how much knowledge we give it, how much we're willing to share with it, what, what we put in um, uh, and enable it to, uh, to pump out at the other end. So, but I think that's the important thing is, is that it is about being an advisor and a recommender um, not something that's going to uh, that replaces the human being, because actually there are always nuances in decision making that need a human being. Because at the end of the day, you're doing it for humans, you're doing it with humans. You need to make sure you have that final stage to make sure you get it right. Sure. Oh my goodness, the most interesting uh, connected device. Well, it sort of is an enormous range. So um, one that I really like is the ability for fruits and vegetables to tell you when they're ripe. Um, so imagine the avocado in your fridge telling you a day before it's perfect ripeness that you should eat it the next day rather than that disappointing thing of cutting into it and finding it's already gone over or indeed cutting open and discovering you should have left it for another three days but it's now too late because uh, you've cut it open and it's just going to go grotty. Um, so on the one extreme, you know, as an avocado eater, that, that's very exciting. On the other extremes, it's things like sensors and jet engines um, uh, for aeroplanes that, you know, tell you when they need maintenance, tell you when something needs fixing in advance of it actually needing that happening in advance of it going wrong. Now, of course, from a safety perspective, that's quite important that things don't go wrong in the air. But just from a, um, from a commercial perspective, in terms of the airlines being able to schedule their maintenance at, you know, at the perfect moment, and for us as travellers, not having that really annoying thing, you've just got on the plane and, and then you wait for an hour because they've might discovered a tiny technical fault and now somebody's got to come and fix it before you take off. So I think that, you know, and, th and then all points in between um, those two things. I mean, the, the, the famous stat is that there are more sensors in the world, more transistors, which is what the sensor is, um, in the world today than there are grains of rice on the planet, which is an utterly extraordinary thought, really. So the, the potential of the Internet of Things is because you can put that sensor in anything, natural or man-made, either. Um, and so the power of that to actually change our world, change our lives for good, um, whether it's about avocado eat, eating or feeling safe on an airplane, um, is, is pretty cool. Uh, so for the potential for augmented uh, reality and artificial intelligence, well, for, for us as a technology provider, of course, these are things that we work with all the time. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, they're part of um, how we develop new solutioning. Um, but, you know, in terms of uh, how we use them for ourselves as well, um, for our own business. So we've done quite a lot with augmented reality with our clients. So um, a few years ago at Wimbledon, we um, developed and delivered for them an augmented reality app that actually enabled you to participate in Wimbledon wherever you were in the grounds. So once you were in the grounds, you could see what was happening on the courts, on the, on the show courts. When you were in the queue, you could see what was happening. You could just hold it up and, and it would tell you where the nearest coffee stand, you know, toilets, all of those kind of, just, you know, simple things. It's amazing how you can put that power into the hands of somebody on a phone and actually uh, really uh, uh, massively impact the experience that they have. Um, with, um, you know, of that event or that occasion. 
Um, and I think it's interesting, really, that l there are not more people doing augmented reality around events. Um, because for, for, for most big events, finding your way around them, and here we are at DMXCO, it's huge, you know, you find yourself running from one hall to the other in order to meet, you know, make a, uh, meet somebody, um, knowing where to find things, knowing where to find people. If I could just hold up my iPhone and, and be able to see immediately, oh, I need to go that way. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, enabling people to participate in things um, that are beyond their immediate visual horizons or audible horizons, I think, is an incredible thing to be able to do. So we do quite a lot of work in, in that space. Um, and artificial intelligence is an interesting one um, simply because uh, it has a very poor definition, I guess. It still has quite a sci-fi definition for most people. Um, but using cognitive computing as we do with Watson um, and applying that natural language processing, again, there are amazing things that you can do um, with applying that approach to all kinds of life problems. So, I don't know, a simple example is if you, uh, if you wanted to use the internet in a hands-free mode, how would you do that? How do you, how do you surf the net if you're not doing it with your fingers on a keyboard or on a touch screen? Um, you can, if you use natural language processing um, uh, and machine learning, which are kind of two fundamental pieces of artificial intelligence, um, you can actually start to create a hands-free internet experience, um, which is radically different from the screen scraping that you know visually impaired people have had to, well, I mean, it's been great because it's enabled them to engage, but they've never had the same surfing experience that you and I have had visually. Um, and so, so you know, you can apply it to things like that as well. And and the thing that's really interesting is you can have uh, you know a massive solution, um, you know, that's for a very large organisation. But you can also do really small scale things that address a very niche problem for a niche group of people, um, because these technologies are now really, really advanced. So IBM in the coming months is going to continue to really focus on three fundamentals. Um, it's all about data, big data, how much of it there is and how you get value from it. Um, it's all about the cloud, which is um, giving people new ways to, uh, to access things, new ways to be dynamic in how you access, access things, new ways to be dynamic in how you develop things. So we, we announced something earlier this year called Bluemix. Um, which is a, a basically a, 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 a cloud-based development platform, but it's about composing apps rather than actually developing and coding apps, uh, which means that pretty much anybody can do it. Um, you can dynamically create a new app in, in minutes, literally. I saw somebody do an app extension in 10 minutes and publish it and it go live in their business in 10 minutes. Extraordinary. Um, and you and I can do it. You don't have to be you know, a, a brilliant uh, technologist to be able to do this. It's, it's very, very straightforward. Um, so I think things like Bluemix you know, in the cloud, enabling people to be really dynamic and fleet of foot in their businesses. You know, Agile is, is, is a, a vital part of most businesses today. And so I think being able to enable that. And then the third piece is around engagement. So we've all changed as individual human beings. Our, our levels of expectations of how we expect to interact with the organizations with whom we interact, whether that's government or, uh, or you know, um, uh, our telephone provider or an energy company or a bank or a retailer or whomever. Um, and, and so um, being able to effectively engage through mobile devices, having a consistent experience, omni-channel, irrespective of how you engage with that organization, um, and really getting a focus on engagement with the customer. Um, and a really systematic approach to engagement uh, with, with a you know, customer or with a citizen has become um, you know, really possible, really possible to do this really, really well. Most organizations still way more to do with it. Um, and so I think you know, the whole social media space, social business, developing um, social businesses using technologies um, um, and underpinning it all, all of those things with security. Um, so, you know, people aren't going to go to the cloud unless it's secure. If it's secure, it's a great answer. It is secure. The good news is it is secure. Um, you know, being able to um, uh, really gain value from big data um, is, is, is really important, but, but it has to be done taking into account all data privacy requirements. Um, you know, and, and then this idea of being able to do all of those things uh, where you, whenever you are, wherever you are, because you can, you can utilize your mobile device. So it's really those three, data, cloud, and engagement. Uh, that's what you'll see us focused on. That's what you'll see us deliver. Um, and that's what our clients care about. 
What excites me about the marketplace at the moment? Well, I think that maybe, I think it probably is the art of the possible that's been uh, created by uh, the Internet of Things, driving huge amounts of interesting data, our own human behaviours and the amount of information we all share willingly, publicly, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Um, I think those two things, the, the, the advance of the technology for mobile devices that enables us to live our lives on the go, you don't have to go to a particular place to be part of something, you can engage remotely um, at, but very effectively. I think all of those things in the market are creating really significant new drivers. Um, they're enabling businesses to do different things, they're enabling us as consumers and citizens to expect and require different things. Um, and, uh, you know, game changing, whether it is in curing cancer um, or just meaning that we have an easier commute to work. Um, I think, you know, all of, all of those things are influencing um, our lives end to end from the very serious and significant to the, to the points of convenience and less frustration. So this afternoon um, I'm going to be speaking in a panel on the art and science of digital marketing um, and I think one of the key questions that keeps coming up around this is as marketing becomes more a science than it has been you know, historically, is there still room for creativity? Um, and I guess my, key, my very uh, strongly held thought is absolutely um, there's still a role for creativity. Uh, the technology and the, and the, the uh, application of, of insights around the customers that we draw from big data are enabling that creativity, but actually we go a step further. It's now about co-creativity. It's not about what I as a vendor do or a brilliant agency do. It's actually about co-creating with our customers um, and, and creating experiences rather than just stuff.